we just start. Uh, I'm Natsa Kimura, the chairman of Open ID Foundation. I'm greatly interested in self-sovereign you know, distributed identity kind of things as well. Actually, I have um, written a chapter on the Open ID Connect specification, which was published in 2014, which pertains to it. But today's discussion, I guess, is um, about financial inclusion and things like that. So I'm really looking forward to uh, talk about it. Okay, um, I'm Shigeya Suzuki, Keio University. Um, I'm also interested in uh, um, self-solving identity and DIDs, and uh, especially how we can um, make use it as a, a global identity for the internet, which is global, globally available now, and uh, we how we can extend the availability of the uh, DID or uh, digital identity um, with regard to the uh, inclusion. That's it. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm now here with you from uh, OpenID Foundation. And uh, I'm also a member of Open the Foundation's uh, EKYC working group. And uh, I'm quite uh, having a deep interest, interest in uh, KYC itself and how to solve the identity proofing problem using uh, uh, Open ID Connect or uh, through sovereign identity or uh, blockchain technologies. That's it. That's all. Can I talk? Uh, my name is okay. Tomoki Ozaki. Uh, I, uh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, my name is Tomoki Ozaki. Uh, I'm interested in uh, regional local currency. And now the local currency is very. Uh, Forecasting because because uh, blockchain blockchain technology is very useful for uh, sharing the ledger uh, all over the world. I mean I mean, but uh, so now the ledger system is comparably cheap price and the uh, solid system can be constructed. Uh, this is my major interest. And there are some people who is interested in op open ID. I'm also interested in ID data. And so ID is very important because blockchain is only for the process ID. I mean, it's not uh, identify the uh, person himself. It, it's just uh, as the process. But I, I'm inter interested in the who who is that people? Who is who is that man? And I think the solution is uh, IP, uh, IP address. IP address is only one in the internet, uh, on the internet. So one person should have one ID so that uh, every person have one, uh, one identity. identity. That's, my, uh, that's my interest. Thank you so much. Can I speak? <laughs> Sorry. I can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, actually, I'm not an, any expert of blockchain or any government re relative person. I'm just a student who study in Japan and mm. I'm really fascinated by, you know, the government, how Japanese government react on these great technologies mm. and the FinSum, I, I take participate in the FinSum for three years, and I, I saw some changes here happen here, and also I'm a report writer for. Uh, I have my blog, and I just writing things that I was interested. So I, um, I'm kind of interested in the I identity of digital society because I am. PhD student uh, study in socializing. So thank you for everybody. I really want to hear about all your opinions and so on. 
Thank you. Yeah, I was double muted. Um, maybe we should sound as well, or? Sure. So again, I'm Rio Skeshida, a deputy director at Quintus Office of JFSA. I'm also a visiting researcher at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., in the United States. I'm doing research on blockchain governance, and one of my interests is digital identity. So from regulators' perspective, what kind of digital identity system is ideal for a society to measure to meet regulatory requirements for the, for the uh, social betterment? So that's kind of our interest, and we will do uh, extensive research uh, this year. So uh, this kind of topic will be great uh, input for us. Thank you. And. Uh... Is that all or uh, Nori that's uh, as well? No, I think that's all. That's all, okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. Okay, so um, the I suppose we actually have the the background uh, published on the website. So just in case, I'd like to um, introduce you to the subject that you know, under the new normal lifestyle. Then follow people who has little documentation that can prove their attributes has a lot of problems, right? And an identity system that enables them to exercise their right by proving their identity is a priority now. And this is not only true to the financially excluded people in the uh, you know uh, in the developed developing world, but also uh, to the people who move to another country, you know, like Japanese, who may have a hard time opening blank in a bank account. You know, Ushida-san may have had that, such an experience, right? And in view of them, uh, some people have been looking at something like self-sovereign identity or distributed identity that may leverage the blockchain. And it, it's been gaining a lot of attention these days. Uh, you know, as a potential measure to transfer or accumulate uh, personal trust on the, the cross-border identity. But there are many technological and legal hurdles as well before it can really be deployed. So uh, one of the main themes in this session is to discuss what kind of digital identity is needed to achieve the financial inclusion with a global point of view as well. And uh, there are a couple of questions that we had uh, during the registration period, like how can we implement digital identity compatible everywhere on the internet globally? Uh, financial inclusion and self sovereign identity or open ID connect for identity assurance and identity proofing. Digital identity based banking. The frequency of what you identify your personal definitions in the jam. How should the digital money link to the divided world of Japan, EU, US, and China? One person, one IP. Edge computing proof of agreement, identity of agreed contents, and the pol policy problems, and the, how my number card can be utilized, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's a lot of topics, but uh, how much time do we actually have? Like half an hour, really? Yeah, half an hour. We have 30, yeah, 30 minutes. Yeah. Hmm? So, so maybe it's a 30 seconds. 30, 30. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I don't think we can cover everything. So um, what should we be discussing? Like, uh, maybe can we just start from the portable identity kind of things? Yeah. yeah. Cool. That sounds nice. Yeah, I, I try to, you know, 
squeeze three or four topics in one one you know, title. So um, maybe Shigeya-san or now Hero, uh, do you want to start? Yeah. Maybe now <laughs> can, can start. Our, 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 okay. I think. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, in terms of the portable identity, uh, and also digital inclusion, I think there are several cases of uh, digital inclusion. Uh, first case is um, in case of the users does not want to share or have some difficulty on uh, share their identities uh, to the applications or services, uh, such as, uh, for example, uh, refugees or asylum uh, do not want to share their information to the uh, government uh, by the by application or services uh, asking the uh, authorities, identity sources, uh, who is him or who is her. This is one case, I think. And the second case is, uh, in case of the user does not have uh, their identity records in any databases, uh, including national identity, uh, it's um, not so common in Japan, but there is. Uh, I, I had that uh, there are hundreds thousand Japanese who do not have uh, records on uh, in, on on Japanese national records. So. Our challenge is how to include these identities onto financial services and so on. How do you think? Yeah, so uh, definitely there. Please. I think that interesting topic. Let me share my example. So I am in Washington DC right now. I moved here last year and before that I was in London. So every time I move to other countries, I have to start from opening banking account. And then every time I was asked to show the kind of proof of residence. But uh, at that time I don't have the proof of residence because I am I was still looking for the new apartment. So uh, I wish uh, I I could prove that uh, I am kind of uh, trusted. <laughs> Guys, so I have some kind of credit history in Japan and in some other countries. And then, uh, in some case, for example, when I issued credit card, some credit card company could refer my credit history in Japan and other countries. But uh, as a, it's a kind of interoperable sol solution by private companies. But I just wish I could bring every my personal data or credit history that I need to start our new life in different mm -hmm. cultures. So that, that's kind of my my uh, my kind of pain point. <laughs> so uh, so uh, when you move to a new country, uh, you you need a bank account to rent an apartment, and you need an apartment to open the bank account, right? Yeah. That's so kind of, yeah, <laughs> quite pain point. So yeah, in mo mo yeah, in most cases. Uh, the bank account opening the base on physical address, so it's very difficult for immigrants and so on. Yeah, when I was living in Los Angeles, when I moved to Los Angeles, I was, uh, I need, of course, I need to bootstrap my bank account or other means of the accounts, and uh, at the time, I could use the help of the uh, as I remember, Smith Bank had the uh, sharing part of the uh, credit history or sort of since they have both both in the Japanese bank, Japanese branch of the Sumitomo Bank and also they have branch in uh, uh, subsidiary in California so they can make use of, of the, the relationship to transfer some of the uh, my history to to the to the to adjust the um, my record so that was 
used to accelerate my situation. So it without that, I couldn't have a credit card very quickly at that time, I think. So that's my experience in terms of that. And uh, um, let me add very little bit, slightly different view on uh, in terms of the discussion to related to the title. The title is, uh, you know, financial, financial inclusion and identity. And uh, um, I'm working on some of the paper for the last uh, last one and a half years, and uh, it is it was talking about uh, about the, the, the um, digital identity. And I think digital identity requires some sort of the public key cryptography key management. And uh, yeah, we usually rely on such kind of thing on the smartphone or very smart devices. But if we are looking at how the financial inclusion means, which is extend, which uh, extend the border of the availability, then if you look at, we are, we are looking at the country which has, uh, and do, uh, which is a country who do not, which do not allow the um, people to have a bank account, for example, there is a country side of such. Of course, that is the extreme case. But uh, in between is a country, I guess, if we can use, start using a digital identity, how the people who only have their damn phones to access to the digital identity. Of course, uh, that we can use the uh, old classic style in our mean, able to use that, but uh, that's it. That does a kind of the, such kind of the authentication or identity system is good enough to achieve the financial inclusion in terms of digital identity? That is my little question. Yeah, but uh, even if you're using dumb phone or feature phone, you could still leverage the SIM. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I guess it's actually de facto bank account in. Yeah many yeah. African countries, right? Like I also, yeah. Pizza, right? Yeah. And uh, it's utilizing UDDI interface. Yes. Yeah. Which actually works pretty well. Okay. Oh, then, yeah. So that is not the, the not the, on the thing to concern. At, at this moment at least. <laughs> yeah, for those people who has that, who has that, right? Yeah, but then the uh, there's been a lot of interoperability issues between the phone country companies, right? For example, in Kenya, there was a Safaricom and uh, uh, I forgot the other company, and they couldn't send money to each other, mm. right? Mm. Uh, not not to mention of how to bring the credit history from one to another mm. is out of question, right? So, and when you cross the border, it's going to become much more acute, right? You have no way of bringing that kind of your payment history with you to, for example, when you move to the United States, there's no way of doing it. Yeah. So that, that kind of credit history or data portability is one issue that needed to be addressed. That's what I call the quote unquote claims problem. Yeah. Yeah. Then the other thing that you just talked about, the uh, cryptographic keys or something like that, that's recognition mm -hmm. of that person. Well, the instance of that person, let's say, which we call as identity, by the way, is uh, um, another issue, right? And then the there need, needs to be a binding between that uh, recognition to those claims, right? Otherwise, you know, if you change your form, all your linked claims are lost. Yeah, in terms of KYC, uh, we can uh, separate the uh, KYC process onto maybe two or three parts. First one is a recognition, the second one is a identity proofing, and the third one is, a, I guess, a due diligence. So it is 
easier that uh, uh, bring their own identity. Uh, this, this term of identity is uh, uh, by attribute itself uh, for identity proofing, but it's difficult to bring their uh, data for customer due diligence. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess it's a better word that uh, we can bring our uh, uh, proof identity in a smartphone and uh, bring it a uh, even different company or country and uh, proof their, themselves using a smartphone. But uh, it, it's not enough to uh, open the bank account for financial institutes because they have to uh, do some due diligence above the uh, I didn't prove in process, I guess. Yeah, so the, the, the trustworthiness of the claims that he brought with him becomes a big issue. Yeah. Uh, even that's if true, even if the data format was standardized mm -hmm. so that it could be read by the you know, verifier, so to speak. I think that's why the blockchain is uh, uh, now uh, a useful financial tool. But I, the biggest problem is uh, uh, blockchain is uh, more than 15% agreement from the all part participants. So that makes very long time to approve the uh, chain. So I think that, that is not, not so useful. So do you think uh, every transaction is uh, more than 50% people's uh, approved all over the world. I think it's it's too much. So I think a uh, big amount needs uh, big, uh, uh, much, much more approved. Approve. But I think small amount can be just uh, small people can approve it so that the speed can be uh, speed up. Uh, I see the future of the blockchain and that, that kind of uh, consensus algorithm, new, new consensus algorithm. Thank you. Yeah, let me uh, point out two things. Um, it is, so 50% consensus is uh, um, to, to, that is uh, for the preventing attacks from a third party. So we, as a, if you try to achieve that, that amount of drawers and the security risk will be higher. So we can't we can't uh, uh, make use of that that uh, the ratio to be lower. That is the first thing. The second thing is that we have DID um, implementers is currently discussing the way to uh, immediately make the DIDs allocated available at the time of the allocation using a kind of technique to attach the DID with a special kind of the information, which is uh, allowed to verify it in a, in a, with, with, uh, using a specialized type of call to, to DID um, method. There's a special, specially designed uh, way to do that, which was just uh, uh, documented in a standard, uh, standard draft document of the DID. So it's possible, of course, it is possible to verify um, only with a certain um, with, with a certain risks. But uh, you can use the IDs very quickly, uh, rather than wait for the for several blocks of um, blockchain block creation. So there's a, a progress in the technology at this, at this moment, I think. So I should point out that uh, for account opening, it's not that much, you know, that time critical. Just waiting 20 minutes isn't a bad thing. You know, uh, well, <laughs> even right now, with a, I'm a quite thick, you know, paper person in Japan, but I, it took like five weeks for me to open the account during the COVID because I guess banks had only 20% of people working on those yeah. papers, yeah. 
but uh, so um, that's one thing. But uh, there are progresses in the technology like DID that is actually trying to separate the recognition of claims and also trying to come up with uh, compatible ways of representing those claims. I, I should also point out that uh, as far as the credit history is concerned, um, the open banking efforts actually can be a good way forward because they're exposing their, uh, you know, the transaction data with the bank's signature on it, right? So it can also be evaluated at the receiving end to, eva you know, to see whether that person is good enough for opening an account. Uh, but up until now, we are uh, well, mainly talking about very fortunate people in the world. There are other kind of people like refugees or the really excluded people from the government that they can't hope to get the government credentials, for example. You know. And these people moving to another country, or these people still staying their country, but trying to receive the aid, has a lot of problems. Right? Uh, even if uh, international community is willing to send the aid to them, there's no way to identify them, right? So, um, one of the, the reason for my interest towards self-sovereign identity is to help with those people as well. Uh, do you have any opinion on, th on that? Hello, can I say something? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. I noticed that I am the only uh, foreigner here. I actually I come from China, and when I first arrived in Japan at uh, twenty seventy, and I was really shocked that I need to go to the city hall and get a lot of I don't know papers, <laughs> and I. In those three years, I write at least 100 times of my name, my passport number, my residence. It's really a shock to me because in my mind that Japan is really a um, developed country. And mm. the, <laughs> the way the, 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 I don't know, the government never <laughs> i don't know how to express it right but it's it's not what i expect and uh, you know the digital money i used here is very limited and you know in china we have alipay we have wechat pay and even my mother who is lived in a very very small village and uh, who is 60 years old she has account, a WeChat account. She has Alipay account because the government already said our retirement, I don't know, re retirement project with Alipay. So we need to hold those accounts. But in Japan, I don't know, we need to send the paper to the city hall to get the money, the 10 yen money last last two months and it's kind of a huge waste to me and i don't know how to explain it right but i think that in at least this time japan has already not that ex, it's i don't know <laughs> developed in this field so I was so curious that why the financial the the FSA give all those regulations and 
I was try to open account in Coin CoinCheck and uh, Bitfly, and I failed because I don't have my number card. And uh, when I upload my uh, resident card, I failed again and again and again. I can't have my account even I can prove myself. Even I have my p passport is kind of, I don't know, <laughs> not my expectation. So when we talk about identity, we the in the digital society and uh, uh, it's kind of a big problem, but I think the government need to do something and the enterprise in Japanese are really um, we are we are today I was listened to all those panels and I think they are they really talk about their acquirements a lot but I don't see any progress or mm. yes there's my own experience but from outside so I think maybe because of uh, Nikkei, because of FSA, because of those uh, these meetings, these conference, we we can make um, late progress or something like this. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your comments. Actually, that's a universal problem for any country. You know, when you're moving into a new country, you're typically a thing file person. And since most financial institutions are just targeted to their main cost constituents, that's their not the that's their national citizens, uh, immigrants will almost invariably have a hard time, just like Ushida san talked about in his experience in the United States. That's like uh, it's the same with me. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. So Joe made a really good point about regulation. So actually, GFSA and their relevant ministries are trying to update our KMC, KM, <coughs> uh, KYC ML regulation so that uh, uh, it can accommodate a new way of uh, onboarding or KMC, KYC ML standard, but uh, uh, actually we uh, changed our guideline to facilitate the uh, eKYC digital KYC online. So that's a little progress. Maybe we might have to do more under this new era, but uh, one uh, big challenge for regulator is kind of uh, that uh, our regulation is based on jurisdictions. So Japan and China have different regulations. So uh, in many countries, I guess, uh, when uh, you open the banking account, the bank has to require the kind of proof of residence or uh, the claims has to be linked to the uh, identity or ID card issued by the local government, in that case, China or Japan. So when I bring uh, my claims based on the Japanese uh, ID card, maybe as a country might not accept that identity or claims because it's, uh, it, it doesn't comply with local regulation. So that, that's a good challenge, uh, cross-dictional challenge. So maybe we have to do work together internationally to achieve uh, the uh, ideal kind of society. So that's, that's my perspective. Thank you. Uh, international standard for portable financial identity claims. That's great. And then maybe that is not only relevant to the financial regulators, but uh, a variety of regulators. So it's a, it's a quite big and a global challenge, I think. Right. I mean, most probably a Japanese bank trying to KYC a Chinese is much less capable than the Chinese bank trying to KYC you know, their yeah. own citizens. So probably relying on uh you know their own jurisdictions certification or something like that might help better 
Yeah, and the yeah. Uh, uh, important difference between China and Japan is that uh, we, Japan, doesn't have a huge platform like Alibaba, I pay in China. So we are kind of fragmented. So there are a variety of financial institutions which provide uh, different types of services. And then all of them have to uh, comply with KYC, even regulation. So in the near future, maybe, uh, uh, maybe they can rely on each other in terms of the uh, kind of onboarding process, but uh, uh, the, maybe there might be some, some uh, blocks to achieve kind of such an interoperable KYC solution. So that's, that's, I think, another challenge. Yeah. yeah. All right, so we've got, sorry, uh, we've got four minutes and 15 seconds. So we need to wrap up and also we need to decide on who's going to present in the main stage. I want to have one minute, okay. Sure, please. Actually, I want to clarify it for Alipay and Chinese government because all the, you know, the Chinese, the Japanese and China, uh, China relationship and because of the what we called opinion uh, public opinions and the media what we what we said about China and what we can see from the medium is actually not that right and many people are, I already um, uh, interviewed a lot of Japanese person why they don't want my number card because they, they think that the uh, something like Chinese ID card they can inspired by government and they think they are it's disgusting and not exact example but i think this is kind of bias opinion because you know in china we have the idea car car id number so we can have the ID ID pay account very quickly and for the internet development and we only have this card to improve my uh, ourselves to prove my ourselves so it's kind of convenient, but it's torturing. I don't know why the US, USA, the Forbes, the Forbes Time or the Nikkei Shinbun, I don't know why they torture those facts. And it's just despite all those Chinese per, uh, government's efforts and I'm not a <laughs> portrait, but I think in this field, Chinese government uh, development. That's all. Thank you. Um, did you want to say something, Ozaki-san? Yeah, uh, I think uh, Cho-san said very, uh, very interesting point because uh, Japanese unique identity system is a Koseki system, I think, and Koseki is very um, so it it uh, it's it, it's it's. Uh, how how can we uh, define the ID? So in terms of Koseki system, I think it's uh, based on family. So whose son is dare dare, whose uh, daughter is C, and whose wife is dare dare. That is a Japanese ID system. And uh, one more thing, the Koseki system is also connecting to the land. So it's this land is someone's. Uh, someone's uh lands that that's that's a, a a very important point of the japanese japanese view of i uh, identity uh so every every culture have the unique uh, identity definition so it's very difficult to uh, connect everything in the in in terms of culture uh, that, that that's why i think the New new IPv6 is uh, it's it's only uh, universal universal systems and uh, there's no no history so it's a very good ch good chance to uh, change everything to under the one one ID system and it's very simple that that's my opinion thank you all right so I guess uh, only two minutes now um. I think that it's the uh, best person as a presenter because you facilitate this discussion very well. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> um, or, okay. Um, 
Yeah, so to sum up, um, unfortunately, we couldn't actually touch on the uh, the very marginalized people's problems, but we still uh, managed to talk a little bit about uh, thin, uh, foul people in terms of the immigration and things like that. And also, we talked a little bit about the nature of the identity systems in each country. And, uh, you know, what could be the basis of the, you know, recognition, I guess. Like, uh, it, it could be, you know, public key, private key pair or SIM or maybe IPv6, who knows. So, that's about it. Yeah. Anything to add? Blockchain? Blockchain is not in the, I mean, out of context, what we discussed, I think. We, we can use blockchain for the, to implement yeah. the thing yeah. we discussed, but it is not, uh, talk, we are not talking about blockchain. Right. Right. Yeah, we're just talking about the requirements and yeah. the blockchain is implementation technology, I guess. Yeah. yeah. All right, so then I probably should shift to the YouTube. Not yeah. actually, it's another WebEx channel, which is on top of the chat box. It's oh, okay. WideCampWebEx.com, right? Correct. Um, okay. I understand that and, uh, other people uh, uh, is still on this channel and uh, Watching on uh, YouTube. Uh, you, can, you can watch on YouTube. Okay. So, yeah, it's mute. Oh, 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 Actually, so, it's, it's the end of the discussion. So, yeah, we can. Uh, okay, okay. Well, so, uh, thank you very much for joining the, uh, the session. And hopefully, we can continue this kind of discussion offline as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye.